Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 28 of uh, Libraries in Recovery. Now we are calling it Libraries in Recovery. Um, we're wondering if maybe we've jumped the gun a little bit. Uh, we were calling it Libraries in Response, which is kind of how this started in late March. Uh, for many of you, first time, and for others, welcome back. Uh, we asked the question in March, once the pandemic was declared, what, what is a library now if the building is closed? I mean, they're open and, and you know, online and maybe curbside and so forth, but mostly uh, we've been talking about libraries as space and a third place for the well, last 10 years anyway. Libraries have been modifying their spaces to accommodate uh, uh, slides, Stephen. Uh, uh, accommodate all kinds of needs, maker spaces and uh, meeting, conferences, classes, and so forth. And now suddenly that's just gone. Uh, and so it suggested the question, okay, well, well now what? And, and, and it's kind of an existential question, I suppose you would say. And so that's, that's how it started uh, as libraries and recovery. And then we felt like uh, after I don't know, seven to eight months, we might be looking ahead. It seemed like everybody kind of settled down into a new mode, but what's next? And, and we have to come out of this at some point. Well, how, and, and, and what does the recovery look like? So uh, that's what we named it Libraries and Recovery. And uh, we've had now, of course, I mentioned 27 sessions, we've had over 3,000 uh, registrations for the series. And we've had just some extraordinary uh, people uh, join us to uh, talk about the different aspects of that question. Uh, and we broke it down in a, in a really simplistic way, but it, it gave us sort of topical guidelines of internet access, digital services, physical materials, and social infrastructure which we hadn't thought about at first, but then of course, on second thought, yeah, of course, libraries play incredibly important roles in their communities at a whole number of uh, levels. So um, today we're, uh, we're gonna get the story of uh, uh, Library 2.0, 2.020, uh, a clever use there, because uh, there's been a number of iterations. Uh, and we have the co-founders uh, and co-directors, I guess, of, uh, of that project and uh, celebrating 10 years. Congratulations, Sandy and Steve. Slide, please. Uh, these are produced by Gigabit Libraries Network and uh, hosted and recorded by our partner in Brussels, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions with Stephen Weiber, uh, there at the controls, uh, keeping track of the need to, to mute and unmute and give us permissions and so forth. Uh, and, and so these are all recorded and available, archived on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net, as you see there at the bottom uh, slide. The topic of the day, uh, and checking the newspaper was not the virus. It was uh, that Arizona has been called for uh, Joe Biden. Okay, that's great, but is that really the top story? Slide, please. In the US, um, uh, a week ago, we slowed the slide a, a week ago, and uh, you can see from the curve, uh, things are, were looking pretty, pretty grim just hitting 100,000 cases uh, and approaching uh, 10 million. Uh, and and the, the rate of change is, is a frightening slide, please. So we've been following these curves for the last uh, month, uh, eight, nine months now. But then this is today, you know, a, a million new cases in the last seven days and the rate of change is skyrocketing. Uh, deaths are booming. Hospital beds are 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 full, uh, and you know there's more to come. So if if this is not the top story of the day by importance, then you know I'm I'm way off. But I guess that's just my opinion. Uh, slide, please. Uh, 
this is a comparison, Germany uh, with 82 million, uh, you know, about a, a fourth the population of the U.S. Uh, uh, Europe looked like it had had contained these. The, the curve uh, in April was very similar to the one in the U.S. And then uh, Europe uh, clamped down on this and, and the, the rate fell. <clears throat> and it was and, and we were, you know, riding on up. And then we kind of tapered a little bit and then up again in uh, July and August. And then down a little bit, not really down, but kind of a little bit flat and then up. So now we're seeing, you know, huge spike across Europe. Uh, most of the countries in, in Europe look sort of like this. Uh, you know, and and uh, so the death rate there, just phenomenal. I have no idea why, why that would be so much more than the, uh, than the case rate, but I guess we'll be continue to learn. Uh, so this is the backdrop of, of libraries in response and hopefully in recovery. Uh, but as we've seen throughout the year, there have been cascading crises of uh, uh, social justice. And then the, the granddaddy, slide please, the granddaddy of all crises is uh, the, uh, you know, the world is heating up. Uh, planetary heating, I, I would suggest, is uh, a better term than global warming. It sounds like something you want in the winter but it's definitely not. Uh, storms, fires, we're getting a little rain today in California, so hopefully uh, the, the fire season will come to an end temporarily, uh, but uh, hurricanes, typhoons in the Pacific, poor Philippines are just getting hammered uh, almost every month. Uh, and then uh, the middle of the, of the US has seen uh, century level floods, you know, every, Every few years, these things shouldn't happen that often. But this is the backdrop. I mean, COVID is urgent today, but this is an emergency. Hopefully, this new administration will step up and and uh, try to deal with that. But nothing so far has been close uh, close enough to uh, really respond on the scale of the of the crisis. Slide, please. Uh, and. <laughs> This, all of this points to yet another crisis, a crisis of connectivity. Uh, we have nearly half the world's population is not connected. Uh, and the ratio uh, uh, of 3.5, 3.4 billion worldwide to 140 million not connected in the US uh, is roughly the ratio of the population of the US to the global population. So what, used to be uh, you know a huge embarrassment that that uh, this the, the country that in, invented the internet is is uh, so poorly connected to the internet uh, is now not merely an embarrassment it's it's completely unacceptable we've got millions of students that are that are not connected just to do basic daily work it freezes a, a whole bunch of things but now in the context of the, of the pandemic, it's just intolerable. So it, we have to deal with that. Maybe this again is, you know, this new administration is coming in with uh, a, a backlog that would have been a backlog four years ago. And now it's a, it's a really deep hole. So we're going to have to see how it goes. And, and, and we'll be exploring what libraries will be doing in this recovery. We'll hope it's a recovery. And uh, slide, please. And today we are um, uh, really lucky to have uh, Sandy and Steve with us uh, to talk about the, the story of, of libraries, uh, Library 2.0. I think I wrote it as library. It's libraries, I believe, 2.0. And, uh, and, and the, the skills, the needs of libraries uh, in the future. And we added the S there to future uh, because there must be multiple futures and some of them we may want and some we want to definitely avoid. But what does that all mean? I've just gone through a list of, uh, of crises and in all of those libraries play a role. They play a role in, in uh, accomplishing the sustainable development goals the UN set uh, and in, uh, uh, the, in the course in the pandemic 
uh, providing information to people, providing content online to people. We've seen such a surge in digital services. And also as a, uh, as a trusted institution in the context of the, the, the social injustice. I, I hesitate to use the word racial. I think uh, racism exists, but races, I think there's one race myself, it's a human race. And, you know, uh, but the, the issue around that since that's the exploded since the, uh, since the George killing has really put the whole country on edge. And uh, that's yet another thing for libraries to deal with. Uh, we had the librarian from uh, uh, Broward County, uh, Kelvin Watson, who may with, be with us today, come on. Uh, he talked about his library system. It's a large system. And he also talked about uh, how uh, we shouldn't just assume because we have the motto, I say we, I'm not a librarian, first disclaimer, but librarians uh, have a motto of open to all, thinking, well, okay, that gives, that clears us from, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, thinking uh, uh, that that may distort how we treat people, uh, and and that we should reexamine that. That libraries should also check themselves for uh, hidden uh, biases, which I think we all should. And uh, no matter how open we think we may be, we may be surprised to find that we that we uh, have some of these embedded uh, uh, distortions in our viewpoints. So let's get to the story of Libraries 2.0 and librarians in the future. We're gonna open with uh, Sandy Hirsch, the Associate Dean of Academics, formerly the head of the, uh, the, the iSchool there at, at San Jose State, which I believe is the largest librarian school in the world, which is a, an astonishing uh, fact if, it's, if it remains true, and it probably does. Uh, Sandy, we ask you to, uh, to uh, talk about uh, uh, libraries and skills, but you know, give us a little uh, background on the, uh, uh, the the school as well, if you would, and and welcome and thank you for being here. Of course, thank you so much, Don. I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, thanks for the great introduction. Um, I will just give a little. Uh, what we're going to do is I was going to first talk, as, as Don said, I was first going to talk about skills and competencies and um, do that as an introduction and then um, a kind of more formal presentation. And then Steve Harganan and I will talk and more in a dialogue uh, fashion about Library 2.0 and how we founded it and um, how it's been utilized to help people build their skills and competencies. So that's just kind of the flow for, uh, for the session. But uh, as Don said, um, I am the Associate Dean for Academics um, in the College of Professional and Global Education at San Jose State University. Um, it's a role that I assumed on March 16th, 2020, which ironically was the first day of the pandemic lockdown in our area. Um, as Don said, prior to that position, I served as the director of the School of Information at San Jose State for 10 years. Um, and uh, as Don said, the school is, um, it's 100%, well, I'm not sure if you said it, but it's 100% online, but it is, um, I think it is still probably the largest um, and in terms of focusing and training uh, the future librarians and people with MLIS degrees. We have over 2000 graduate students in the school and uh, being 100% online, they come from all over the world and are able to participate and learn in that uh, environment. and. Given that our school has been 100% online since 2009, you could say that our school is very well prepared to handle the shutdown due to the global pandemic since we've been functioning in a very distributed way for quite a long time. But speaking and more directly about um, you know, what I'll be discussing in this presentation, um, you know, librarians during these trying times, librarians are serving their communities and are continuing to remain relevant despite the COVID-19 pandemic. And as David Lenke's recently put it, people are looking for comfort and guidance, but also meaning and community. So I'll be talking um, about the role of libraries in providing that meaning, meaning and the competencies and uh, skills that are now required 
And also I'll highlight a little bit about how library and information science schools are preparing graduates who are equipped with those skills to adapt, respond, and to serve. So in her in um, her Los Angeles Times article on how do you go to the Los Angeles Public Library when COVID-19 has closed its buildings, it's easy. She highlights that as many library doors have closed, many library doors, virtual ones have opened and have greatly extending the library's reach. And so while we've watched, as Dawn has talked about, the libraries close its doors, we have also seen them adapt and respond and pivot and find new modes of serving the community. Uh, when libraries close their doors uh, due to the local mandates, as you know, there was a rush to adapt in-person services to meet er Im immediate, urgent, and now remote needs of their community. The demand for libraries to provide critical access to technology and the internet increased and librarians sought ways to loan out laptops, tablets, and Wi-Fi hotspots and provide 24 seven access to online tools and resources and with many keeping their Wi-Fi on 24 seven. So librarians have had to step into these new roles due to these new demands and they've become information hubs on COVID-19 because people trust librarians more than they trust government and media sources. Um, librarians are also now supporting teachers and students and parents as they na navigate through online learning. And librarians are supporting academic research and learning by providing greater access to online resources and virtual reference services, including virtual chat and office hours. So as many of you probably experienced yourselves directly, when libraries closed, librarians were faced with many new challenges. Uh, they've had to replace those in-person services with virtual and contactless services. They've had to adapt to remote work, serving their community from their homes or through limited, if any, office hours. They've had to cope with their own stress, their own burnout and anxiety over health and safety while serving the community. And they've had to reskill and upskill, especially in the area of technical expertise in order to provide those virtual services. And they've also had to face the challenge of supporting remote learning as the digital divide has widened. The pandemic has challenged libraries and librarians to be resilient and innovative. For example, librarians have had to adapt quickly to disruptive transitions between the reopening and reclosing plans and the reopening and reclosing as we've had to do this repeatedly. I've had to innovate and create new programs to replace in-person activities, providing virtual maker spaces and virtual story times. We've had to increase social media presence, but at the same time, continue to somehow reach those people who aren't as digitally connected and they've had to cultivate new community partnerships, such as job centers to support reskilling and upskilling for an inclusive, um, inclusive economic recovery. Some of these changes will have lasting impacts and will likely to continue after the pandemic is over. So we might see that libraries will continue to offer contactless services such as self-checkout and may offer continue to offer curbside pick up for the convenience of users and they may continue to um, they're likely to continue some expanded virtual services and programming. Um, but but other changes may end after the pandemic and so, for example, we may no longer have as much remote work for staff and publishers might stop offering free temporary access to e resources. Both library users and librarians are having to adjust to what librarians can provide during these changing times. As Linda, uh, Linda W. Braun, past president of Yelza explains, it's not about what people already use the library for, but how to change the way people are thinking about library services and what that means. These uncertain times also require librarians to apply different and sometimes acquire new types of skills and competencies. In this article, librarians in the era of artificial intelligence and data deluge, uh, Frederick observed that instead of being specialist skills, e-resources, virtual services have become foundational skills and knowledge and a normal part of most librarians' duties. So some specific examples and, of skills and competencies that are now defining the new normal for librarians include 
you know, virtual reference and, uh, and research support. And uh, many of these things libraries were already doing maybe in part or um, you know, in some limited way, but now these have become the major way that, people, that libraries are having to deliver their services and really means that people have to build up their skills and competencies to, to, to make those more robust. So virtual reference and research support, then this will remain uh, important even after the in-person services resume. Also instructional design for online learning. This I expect will continue to grow as more institutions adopt online models for educational delivery. Also e-resource collection development. This is needed as libraries invest more in e-resources and less in those physical materials, kind of building on what Don was talking about in terms of shifting from the physical space into more virtual environments. There's also the importance of having skills around embedded librarianship, and this will require strong technical information and people skills, as well as the um, ever increasing growing importance of having effective communication skills. And this is especially important um, and essential for outreach to connect people with resources and also to advocate for social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. As librarians fill these new roles, um, we're also witnessing increased demand for what we're defining as more maybe emerging skills and competencies. Things such as expanded personalized services um, to patrons for a variety of needs such as access to healthcare, how to apply for benefits, similar to what social workers do. Um, there's also the need for having enhanced user experience and usability skills to meet information needs while providing a welcoming digital environment. And then there's also the increased um, um, need for knowledge of emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and tracking technologies which are being used to respond to the pandemic. And so it's very important for librarians to keep up with these and other emerging technologies in the changing information landscape. And then um, it's also important to uh, make um, for librarians to have um, a knowledge of controlled digital lending, open educational resources and open access. These are needed um, as to increase the access to essential resources uh, needed for remote learning environments. As we look to the future, like, uh, leadership skills and competencies rise to the forefront to focus and foster healthy, adaptable, and sustainable libraries. Uh, we've never needed change management skills more than we need them now, and we must act as change agents to rethink the future of libraries, not just to revert to former practices when the pandemic ends. Librarians also need strong crisis management and contingency planning skills. We see, and that's something that I don't think historically has been taught in library and information science programs, but something that is uh, all, every librarian is being called upon to, um, to marshal uh, their skills and do their best in these environments. And we're gonna see a growing need for these kinds of crisis management skills, not only due to the pandemic, but also due to the increasing frequency of other types of disasters, such as the wildfires that we've been plagued with here in California and the hurricanes that are happening in other parts of the country and uh, the other kinds of disasters that Don was talking about in his introduction. Librarians also need some uh, facilities management skills uh, with a focus on the health and safety for uh, staff and patrons, as well as understanding the importance of factoring in the need for new spaces and uh, that will favor more modular rather than open uh, floor designs. So this is actually a big flip from how libraries have been designed over the past, I don't know, decade or two, where we've been focusing on making things modular and making things open and uh, feeling light and open. And now we're having to rethink that in light of the pandemic and making sure that we have more closed off spaces and um, uh, so it's a big change and we're gonna have to continue to adapt as we learn more and as um, our situation changes. And then librarians also need budget and resource management skills, particularly to make the tough decisions during the lean times about uh, which resources and services to prioritize and which to cut. 
And then library leaders um, need advocacy and fundraising skills and the ability to demonstrate the value of the library to funders um, such as government agencies, school administration, grant makers, and voters. So at the base of the librarian's ability to adapt and to respond and innovate and remain relevant is their educational and professional development journey. Library and information science schools have been forward thinking and responsive to the emerging skills and technology skills and competencies that will prepare librarians for the future. So most library and information schools already have been offering 100% online or hybrid programs prior to the global, global pandemic. I'd say that the field of library and information science has been a, just generally a leader in online education, one of, one of the leading areas that have been um, embraced online education early and offers that quite widely in our field. And this experience with online learning and other learning modes has prepared many professional librarians today with a strong understanding of the virtual learning environment. Distance learning prepares students to work and collaborate virtually, and these librarians serve as valuable resources for teachers and educators who are new to adapting to remote teaching and to students who are new to adapting to remote learning and to workers who are new to adapting to new methods of working from home. Uh, library and information schools have adapted themselves in response to the pandemic. For example, schools um, have uh, continuously adapt their curriculum in order to equip librarians for the future and evolving community needs. Uh, San Jose State uh, University School of Information has offered a course actually in disaster informatics for many years, but that's a pretty unique um, offering um, that our school has provided. Uh, library and information science schools also provide opportunities for students to develop cultural competencies. So, for example, San Jose State iSchool weaves a focus on diversity throughout all of its courses. Plus, it hosts a diversity webinar series and offers several courses dedicated to that topic, such as library services for racially and ethnically diverse communities, intercultural communication, and cultural competence for information professionals. However, the pandemic has also increased disparities, which means more outreach and financial support is needed to foster student access. Many library and information schools were already prepared, as I said, prior to the pandemic to support students with virtual career support services or have responded by expanding these services as a result of the pandemic. Library and information science schools offer advising, professional development, career planning, advising, and 100% to um, for 100% online to support online students studying remotely. So examples at San Jose State iSchool include a range of virtual career development resources, such as an annual MLIS Skills at Work, a snapshot of job postings which is a report to look at trends in job titles and skills that are required in the workplace, as well as other supports such as virtual career e-portfolios, mentoring and networking opportunities, and guidance on search job search strategies and interviewing. Additionally, San Jose State iSchool provides access to virtual professional development opportunities, including the free Global Library 2.0 virtual com mini series conference that we'll be talking about just very shortly in our conversation, my conversation with Steve on that, um, as well as things like iSchool career podcasts, which provide career insights and advice from expert practitioners from various professional pathways and the iSchool online career workshops. So in summary, we have been greatly impacted, all of us in all different kinds of ways by the pandemic. Libraries and librarians are uniquely affected because of their essential role in the community in supporting learning, connectivity, creativity, and providing digital and technological access. Libraries have adapted to meet the needs of the communities they serve, and we're sure to find a new normal as some of these changes permanently impact how libraries serve the, their community, both in terms of what new practices will be kept as well as what will fall by the wayside. 
So as we discuss some of the essential skills and competencies required for librarians to serve their communities while leading into the future include instructional design and embedded librarianship, uh, digital resources and programming, um, emerging technologies, and communication skills, outreach and advocacy, crisis man uh, uh, change management and crisis management, facilities management, social justice, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion. So access to the, learning these new skills and competencies are included in most library and information science curriculums, as well as through professional development resources, such as certificate programs, the library 2.0 conferences, webinars, et cetera. It's important for librarians to continue to prepare not only for today's challenges, but also for tomorrow's opportunities so librarians can remain relevant and are well positioned to weather any storm. Thank you. So that was my formal presentation Wonderful. about, yes. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that was the formal bit. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, no, as, that was awesome. Uh, you, I was wondering what, was not on that list of skills needed. <laughs> I, I'm trying to, we refer to libraries, we've started referring to libraries as the Swiss army knife of public institutions. <laughs> and, you know, you think of it from the services side, you know, all these different things the library provides, but we almost never think about it from the librarian side of actually providing all those services, what it means to be competent, all those different skills and how, you know, what kind of a person does it take the, to become a librarian, let me ask you that question right up front. What, what, how would you describe the, 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 the talents or the skills, or the, the, the natural uh, inclinations of a, of a librarian? Um, for me, I, I always think about it. I, I, I always think about it as somebody who's really passionate about the user, about people, um, about making sure that people have access to the information that they need and um, you know, are, are, um, are you know, interested in the, the, a range of ways of making that happen through technology or through in-person activities. So it's really about or, or creating the tools that are needed to provide that information to the user. For me, it's the users at the heart of it or the community is at the heart of it and being really um, focused on that. Um, I've always thought of, of our field as the kind of the original user-centered discipline. And um, it, so for me, that, that's how I think about it. So, um that sounds like somebody that wants to help people. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Uh, I, I think that's uh, true. Yeah, the, the, the discussion about spaces. So we saw some responses. We asked, you know, uh, who's open, who's closed and partially. And so there's a lot of, as you mentioned, back and forth, open and closing. Uh, it seems like it's going to be a very long time before, if ever, we sort of go back to what we considered normal, you know, in January or whenever. Uh, so does that mean we'll, you know, we'll want to kind of keep a little bit more distance than we used to for COVID or any, any other kind of, uh, uh, you know, the flu, whatever. Will that, do you anticipate mean that we need more space because right now we're saying okay 10 people at a time can come in you can come by appointment this is not the not the library that we've been living with for the last I don't know 50 years or so do you imagine that the library itself will be a different space uh, definitely I mean to be honest I think the libraries have been evolving on an ongoing basis and as things have I don't think, feel that libraries have been static at all. And that's part of what makes our field so exciting and interesting because as information has, as information, new types of information and new technologies are developed, libraries I find are often some of the first and most innovative and open to trying new things. And um, so for me, I don't, 
I think that this is another step in our evolution. It wasn't one we picked, but it's one that every every um, institution yeah. is, everybody is having to deal with. Um, so I imagine that some of the things that um, that we're implementing are going to stay, and and um, there'll be new changes until the next big big shift happens. So um, I do think that. Uh, I'd be surprised if everything goes back exactly to this and uh, normal. I'm seeing that in San Jose State as well, like in front, and from a higher education institution. Um, you know, while our school, um, the School of Information was already 100% online, the rest of the university was still offering education face to face. And, you know, in a, I mean, the majority of the other units were functioning just like every other university right. generally. And, um, I think that I'd be surprised if higher education returns also back to 100% the way it was before. You know, there's going to be some that are going to be like, oh, online education is really interesting. I think we'll do more services in that or some of the services that people couldn't imagine could ever be done um, in a virtual format. And now they're doing it and it's working. So probably some of that will remain. And I think the same is true in libraries as well. I, I agree. Uh, but speaking of that, since uh, uh, since the iSchool is already online, have there been surprises? Have, have you really had to change much with in how you provide your, your educational services? No. I mean, <laughs> in a word, no. In a word, no. I mean, okay. that's, I mean that's what I said. I mean, we have, I guess we are at the iSchool. At San Jose State was pretty well positioned to, to handle this. I mean, I've been 100% online since fall 2009, so it's been more than 10 years. And, you know, we've been evolving and investing in, you know, our online pedagogies and how we, our technologies and how we deliver and how we support our students. So, you know, there really wasn't a change for us um, in terms of uh, how we deliver or anything. But the, the one thing that is different and it's really, um, it, it's more of a um, being sensitive to people's unique situations and having to be more accommodating due to the pandemic. It's not really a change in how we're delivering or offering mm -hmm. education, but there's a, a need to, to be sensitive to people's and accommodating to people's unique circumstances who are being affected in, in numerous ways by the pandemic, whether it's financially help or other kinds of kinds of ways. And that's something that the, um, San Jose State High School has already had to be doing um, because we do have students in all around the world. There's often disasters happening in other parts of the country or other parts of the world that are impacting our students, our faculty, its ability to, to um, meet their, deliver their educate, you know, participate in the ways that they would normally do. So we've had to be sensitive and accommodating uh, for our students and faculty because of that for some time, but now of course, in a, in a yep. general way due to the pandemic. So uh, you could say San Jose State is an early adopter uh, of what is now our kind of current normal uh, we've said this about libraries for some time, at libraries as early adopters. Uh, of course, our, our orientation has mostly been around technology and connectivity, uh, but, but, you know, libraries, um, they act as uh, uh, kind of showcases for emerging technologies, uh, you know, from books themselves. Uh, to first generation broadband when a lot of people, you know, they heard about it, they didn't know what, was, what the people were saying and they went to a library and they experienced, you know, streaming media uh, uh, at a library and go, oh, that's what everybody's talking about. I like that. I want that at home. And so this, this role we think is really, uh, really important for libraries and is underappreciated because libraries will drive demand for all these services and products that, uh, that it's difficult for people to understand or experience on, on their own. So um, uh, thank you. This is the marvelous story of the university and its flexibility and, and you know, and your, your attitude, I think, is, is so important for getting through this and all the other 
background crises that we're dealing with. Let's let's go to uh, uh, to to Steve uh, 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 now to uh, give us the story on Libraries 2.0. This is a phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, you know, I get kind of weary thinking about you no know, this is session 28 uh, you know and we've been doing this for 10 months well you know libraries 2.0 has been going for 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 10 years and uh so we want to hear this story and and uh how uh, how you think this is going uh going forward you know the story the history and the, and the future of libraries 2.0 2.0 <laughs> that? so steve are you with us I am. And Sandy came up with this. I think it was Sandy, but it's the numbering system. So every year it's library 2.020. Last year it was 2.019, or that was 2.018. So it's kind of a play on the library 2.0. But the 2.0 is worth talking about. You want me to describe that, the genesis of that? Sure. So that, that was Tim O'Reilly's group uh, that was looking at the companies that had survived the dot com bust the internet companies. And they were trying to figure out what distinguished them from the companies that didn't. And what they determined was that 2.0 represented companies that created a platform for user content rather than providing the content. So a good mm. example would be Wikipedia versus Encyclopedia Britannica. Everything we do in social media now follows that model, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're looking at content provided by other users. So 2.0 had that original connotation of user content, but it also indicates, I think for most of us, the next level, right? So there's the, there's the existing level and then 2.0 is something above that. And efforts to go 3.0, 4.0, you see them, but I think that they don't really take hold because there's just this sense that 2.0 is just the next level. And, and we don't really need to, to have all these iterations. There's a distinction between where we are now and where we're, our next step. I had interviewed Mark Andresen and Gina Bianchini. Mark was the creator of the Mosaic web browser early. I was doing a, an interview series on open source software and education. And Gina was his business partner and they created something called Ning. And Ning was a build your own social networking platform. And a guy named Bill Drew created Library 2.0. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. And I started something called School 2.0, but it really didn't gain any traction. People didn't want to talk about School 2.0, but one day I rebranded it as Classroom 2.0 and it took off. So Classroom oh. 2.0, meaning sort of the next iteration, it's the, uh, it grew very fast. And within the education space, the K-12 education space was sort of a phenomenon, right? All of a sudden seeing social networking as a positive especially for teachers who are isolated in other ways. So there's Classroom 2.0 and Library 2.0 kind of going along together. And at a certain point in time, uh, Bill got tired of Library 2.0. I think it wasn't doing for him what he wanted it to, or it wasn't growing. And he said he was going to shut it down. And I said, hey, I'm not a librarian, but I love libraries. And I would hate to see this go away. Can I take it over for you and keep paying the fee and just run it? And he said, yes. And at the time, it was about 4,000 members. It's now 44,000, 42,000, 45,000 members. And so it's been really fun to watch it continue to grow um, in large part because of the, the, um, the work with San Jose State and with Sandy and the, and the mini conferences, what had been conferences and mini conferences. I'm sure we'll tell that story in a minute. Um, but so uh, uh, I was working at the time for a company called Illuminate that provided online classroom services. They were bought by Blackboard. And Blackboard uh, restructured a lot of things, but can Blackboard collaborate? And one of the things they did early on was they canceled a number of appointments and speaking engagements and the like that had been set up by Illuminate. And someone was supposed to go to San Jose State and speak at a little conference they were holding, but Blackboard had turned all of that off. And I don't remember if it was Sandy or someone else, or they sent an email and said, would you still come? Would you still come? I think it was Debbie. To... Was it Debbie? I think oh, it was fun. Debbie. Oh, no, I didn't know that part of the story, but yeah, I'm glad to I think know so. it. 
So anyway, they said, would you still come? And I lived in Sacramento area at the time. And so I, it was a couple hours drive and it wasn't huge. And I'm a nice guy. So I said, sure, I'll just come, right? And I came and Sandy, you and I met for 30 seconds or something. It was very short. 30 seconds. It was about that. And I gave my talk and, uh, and then we uh, later connected and I had started something called the Global Education Conference, which is a worldwide conference for global educators. And we can try and recreate the details of the story. I'm not sure we'll be able to, but at some point Sandy and I said, hey, could we hold an online conference for librarians? And it started as this great multi-day, 24 hour a day event with hundreds of presentations and all kinds of volunteers. And, oh, it's been such a fun ride. But yes, this past, this current year is our 10th year. Yeah, well, when we started it, when we started that conference, we did our, our we did it as a 24 hour a day conference. And we had simultaneous, we had multiple presentations and time slots and people um, we had crowdsourced presentations and we had people who could present in, they could present in their native language. Um, so we didn't provide translation, but, you know, our assumption was that they could present in that language and they'd be talking in their time zone. So other people in that time zone may, would be able to understand, be recorded and freely available. Um, and uh, we, so our first several conferences that we did were these big global 24 hour a day conference, multi-day conferences that we did, um, uh, which we had to staff with volunteers to moderate each one of those sessions as well. Uh, it was quite a big, quite a big uh, launch when we first started. It was a massive undertaking. And yeah. I, can, I can remember describing to people, it was like we were learning to fly the airplane when it was filled with people and traveling across continents because we were just so shocked that it worked. And then people were so excited. I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but this was at an era when that ability to communicate with people all over the world in different cultures through topics, it was not normal. And it was just thrilling to be a part of it. It, it really was. And we, our very first conference was in October of 2011. And to my knowledge, it was the first very, it was our, the first global like conference that was held virtually like that, at least in our field. Um, and uh, that with, with the goal of really t being truly inclusive globally, that was our goal was to, to bring together information professionals around the world. And we made tremendous efforts to have keynote speakers from, from each continent who would participate um, in the conference. And we had global kind of advisory board to try to help spread the word and, and build interest in um, this. And um, from San Jose State's perspective, it was our goal to kind of do partner with Steve on this um, library conference to, um, for a couple of reasons. One was to kind of open up the, the understanding about what it was to, to engage in a virtual format, which was very new at that time. In 2010, 2011, it wasn't so common to think that you could bring people together to converse and to share information in, a, in, in that kind of a format. Um, and as a 100% online school, it was, we felt that this was a part of our brand and you know part of what we did and the other thing was as a way to give back to the professional community because it was important to us to have this be um you know open to anyone um to give everyone an opportunity to participate if they wanted to speak and you know and and to engage, to share what they knew, as well as to be a learner or a participant or a, uh, in the other sessions. And uh, to do that for free to, for people, that was important to us. And to do it in a way that they could participate in real time or to we would record, everything's are recorded and archived. Um, and the ability to have the community help choose the presentations to have things be crowdsourced. So we had many kind of tenants that we focused on um, uh, for the library 2.0 to make sure that it was 
um, something of value. And it was a, it was the sense of bringing that information professional community together worldwide, um, I think was at the heart of it. Great. Well, what is the, what is the geographic distribution of the, of the membership? Is it mostly U.S. or half or how, how would you describe that? That's a question I should probably answer, and it means okay. I should probably know. And I, uh, we need to do some reporting in that regard, but, and we have in the past, but I, I would say it's um, I, the, the membership of Library 2.0, the community that the, the conference is based on, is probably something over slightly over half US-based, yeah. which says a lot, yeah. right? Which is it's very much an international crowd and audience. Right, right, um, right. And that's what social networking did. It created mm -hmm. this ability for us to connect across geographic boundaries, not just from library to library, but from country to country and having people be able to talk to each other. I want to expand quickly on a couple of things from Sandy. One would be, we did have an open call for proposals and all proposals were public. So it meant that people could actually connect with each other even before they started the process of attending the conference. So it was within the platform of the social networking community that everything took place. So if you found somebody, the idea was that you could connect with them and have your own conversation with them. The other is that we used a dental scheduling program to allow presenters to schedule at times that were convenient for them. So once someone got mm. accepted, they then could go in and schedule their own time. And there were a number of slots per hour, but it did mean that in some ways we kind of uh, automated the process of a large scale conference. So once you yeah. got accepted, then you had to take the training and we had, we had live trainings that were available and then you had to schedule your session. And then there were calendars and, Oh, Don, how many time zones do you think there are in the world? How many, what time zones? 24. Right. So that's the answer we would think, right? But there's something right. like 36 or 37. Uh, anyway, so you have all the daylight savings times that exist, and then you have India and Nepal that are on the half hour and the quarter hour. So we had, had set it up that you could come in to attend the conference and see the schedule in your own time zone. And so that was a lot of fun, right? Figuring out how to do that within Google calendars so that you could come in, see the schedule in your own time zone, and then click through to a session that, that was running at the time that you were available. Rather than adjust your calendar to the time, you adjusted the time to your calendar. That's clever. <laughs> it was so much fun. We need to talk about that. Uh, we've taken a number of pages out of your book uh, here. I mean, we're, we've had international presentations and of course IFLA is, is hosting and, and, uh, and we've run up against this time zone issue. Uh, we haven't had a presenter from Asia yet. Um, so, but you know, it's eight o'clock, as you know, I, I think, I don't actually know where you are, Steve, but uh, you're in California. No? I'm in North Carolina. Grew North up in Carolina, California. See? <laughs> so, and, and, uh, Steve, and, yeah. and Steve and I have been working together now for 10 years. And I, Steve and I have probably met in person maybe three times in that entire time. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing projects with people I've never met in person. Uh, yeah. uh, so where is it? Where is it going? Uh, first of all, let me let me ask you a question about uh, 2.0, the concept uh, that that you mentioned. Tim O'Reilly had introduced. Tim uh, has a big publishing firm and, and technology manuals uh, of, of user generated content. How do you see that? This is a question for both of you. How do you see that? coming into the library world already and in the future? Do you think more or what is that exactly look like? I'm not sure. That's Wait, probably, uh, yeah. That's user generated for you, content, Sandy. I believe that was the concept, right? Steve? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to it from the standpoint of the conference and, and it's probably worth talking about how the conference has shifted from a multi-day mm -hmm. event to three smaller, very topic specific events and why. But from the standpoint of user generated content, we think that part of what the conference has done is it's given voice to people that there's, there's something that happens in a professional career when you present at a conference, you, you feel differently, your, your sense of self, your capacity as a professional, 
part of what we hope the conference has done is it's given people a platform for finding that voice. Uh -huh. So there are a lot of people for whom presenting at Library 2.0 was their first presentation experience. Um, and it was so exciting. And even if they were presenting at 2 a.m. and there were three people in the room in those early days, they were so excited to be in that role of presenter. So I think that made a big difference. Sandy is probably better suited to talk about the role of user content as part of the information ecosystem in libraries. Yeah, I mean, I, and Steve explained well about um, the conference and how that connects in with what we're doing uh, in the conference. And uh, actually I did a survey of the Library 2.0 community and participants uh, in June and I'm still finishing up the results, but I mean, that was what Steve said in terms of giving people that opportunity to um, share their perspectives and um, in the conference and get that experience as a presenter is something that still is, um, is something that is a valuable part of the library 2.0 experience. Um, it, in terms of the user generated content, that question, I'm trying to think about what um, what, what I want to say about that, um, other than the fact that uh, you know we've seen such a growth of the importance of user generated content in ways that we could never have imagined when I was in library school that that would be something that we'd be dealing with in such large quantities and that would take on the role of um, such significance and importance in shaping people's thinking and um, the ease with which you have the ability to share user generated content um, and how it's hard to separate out user generated content versus that professional or you know authoritative content and, and it's all co-mingled and mixed in a big swirling pot so it's hard to um, to, to uh, you know figure out where that fact and fiction is and um, you know and what's valuable and what's not valuable and it's become very noisy I, I would say um, yeah. uh, but <laughs> That's just one way Sandy, to say it. Yeah. So let me speak as a fan of libraries. So what I would say is I love it that it's the school of information, right? And if there were ever a profession that was well suited to help navigate the waters of the information explosion from the internet, it would be libraries and <clears throat> librarians and library staff. And it's been surprising to me since I live in both the K-12 and the library worlds to see librarians uh, not regarded as highly as they might be. In some ways, it's a, it's a cognitive dissonance that maybe tells us something about our time, right? That people who are really good and professional at understanding information aren't being sought as out as much as I would think they should be. For me, the librarian is in many ways the, the new mentor of a new learning ecosystem, or at least could be. So it's fascinating to me to sort of think, okay, we're, we've still held on to this kind of top-down compliance generated view of schooling where libraries provide this opportunity for individual exploration with no grading or without prying eyes. <clears throat> and so I think of the library as sort of this bastion of private intellectual exploration. And one of the things that I think has happened is that libraries have have sought for relevance in other ways. So like a, the makerspace movement. I, I love makerspaces. I get why they are popular, but I've always sort of felt like I wanna protect the library. The library can become a makerspace, but if the library is now a makerspace rather than a library, I'm missing something. And so for me, the, the, we're, we are in a world without editors. Right? There were previously editors who, who would make selections. And so now in this information age, who better to help us understand how to be our own editors than people who've dealt with information there during their whole career. That was a little bit of a soapbox. No, that's, no, that's a good one. Yeah, that was great. Uh, we've been trying to build a bridge between information technologists and information scientists that they seem, this is one of the groups that seems to take libraries for granted or ignore them altogether. Actually, we've seen three populations. The technologists who go, you know, what's the point? You know, they just get it online or whatever. Uh, uh, wealthier people 
tend to appreciate libraries for someone else, not so much their own use. And then politicians, for some reason, seem to uh, lack understanding of libraries. Maybe they're just less mm, literate or oriented to literature or, or culture. I don't know. But those are important populations to understand the library, even as roughly half the population are, are active library users, which is a stunning number. Uh, and uh, so you're right about this, you know, this underappreciated, overused, taken for granted institution. Uh, there, the other public agencies keep transferring uh, uh, jobs over to the library. You know, e-government has been uh, an explosion of demand for library support. You know, they've closed their offices and you go, well, how, how do you support people? Well, go to the library, they'll help you. Well, yeah, they will, but you do it for all these reasons of cost savings and, and efficiency, but you never share any of those savings with the library who's taking on yet another another role. They're just, a, libraries would just say yes to everybody. So everybody says, well, go to the library. That'll, that'll be the answer for you. Uh, but I, I appreciate your, your fandom, Steve. I'm, I'm in that group, uh, a huge fan, a, a library lover and a, a professional advocate of libraries. I had never predicted in a million years I'd end up here, but you know, here we are. It's, 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 uh, you remind me though of, uh, the Shelby foot quote, the, the, famous historian who said uh, a library, I mean, a university is nothing but a library surrounded by some buildings. And I think it's kind of your point, Steve, is that, you know, information is at the, is at the hub of learning and uh, a school, uh, 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 a modern school, an advanced thinking school, seems like it is that same thing. It's the library at the center of, of learnings and increasingly self-directed and different uh different levels and speeds and, and tailored to the individual so um we uh, here's a question for you sandy in terms of uh the different libraries we're we're just over our hour but if you take a few more minutes uh, and then we'll ask you to close out but uh how do you see the possibility for collaborations between the different types of librarians, the school librarian, the public librarian, the academic librarian. I know San Jose State hosts the public library, a San Jose, city of San Jose public library is in the, on the campus. But what do you see for how, how these librarians that are in the same locations and share overlapping populations can collaborate in, in delivering services? I mean, I think that happens already. I mean, we see schools and public libraries working together. You know, public libraries have traditionally, you know, provided like homework centers and other kinds of supports to support the school populations. And, um, you know, uh, so there, there's multiple ways that um, libraries of different types can work together to support each other. Um, and as you mentioned there at San Jose State, we do have a, a unique joint use um, building um, that is joint between the academic library at San Jose State and the public library system at, in San Jose Public Libraries. And um, that, but that is not a widespread model that is fairly unique. There's a few yeah. others that are like that. That's but there's that's definitely not uh, common. Um, and uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't other ways that that um, different um, types of collaborations take place um, across type of library. I think that one of the big there's, there's several big challenges, and if you do talk with them, um, uh, the folks in San Jose, like about the joint use. I mean, there's some common challenges in terms of different funding models and different demands on um, their leadership, you know, who they're reporting to that, that governs their work that can be quite different, licensing agreements that can be quite different. Um, you know, so there's a variety of challenges that can um, make things a little bit difficult for, um, you know, for some of that, but there are other ways that they can work and collaborate depending on what their problem they're trying to solve or what, what, what the benefits are for the different, for the community. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, a lot of challenges uh, and, and yet opportunities as, as, the, yes. as the saying goes, uh, a lot of people are not aware that the, that the libraries and public universities, at least in California are public, they're open to the public. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, 
probably the only building on the campus that's open to everybody, maybe the administration building, but, uh, you know, it's, and people can take advantage of that and, and they should. Sure. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's wrap up here. Uh, we'll ask Steve to give us a close on, on what he sees uh, ahead. And we also ask for a, a, a call to action. What would you like to have people do or, or yeah. Yeah, call to action, Steve. Okay, I'll start by quickly saying we've moved to the format of three mini conferences each year on topics with, to with specific topics. So our last one was on sustainabilities and libraries, our October conference, and we've shortened them up to three hours, very short, short blocks with 12 to 16 sessions during that time and shorter sessions. So I think the kind of the wrap up for me is that in information saturated world, people need specifics. They, they, you know, we get about 5,000 plus signups for each event out of an audience of about 60,000. So each event we know is not gonna appeal to everybody like our previous big conferences did. But it's this idea that in an information saturated world, people need to be able to latch on to something and get some good information in a short amount of time. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing to think about that, that that's a shift in how we've thought previously about providing information and information services. I guess my call to action would be to, from my standpoint as a, as a library fan, is to talk about the virtues and values of private intellectual exploration. There's so much of kind of a mob mentality around topics right now. It's so difficult to talk about complex issues. And one of the things I like about the concept of the library is this bastion of private intellectual endeavors that I can read up on something, I can change my ideas, but I can do research and I can figure things out. And maybe the call to action is to remember that ethos as we talk to others, that this idea that, they're, that we're all trying to figure things out. And the moment we start to put someone else in a box or we decide that they're bad or someone else is good based on the opinion that they hold. We've lost our ability to go through that private intellectual journey that's so important. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much. Sandy, you had the first word, you get the last word. Oh, great. Well, uh, I was going to be very concrete on my uh, call to action, which was uh, in terms of uh, the library. 2.0 community and we welcome all of you to to join that community if you're not already part of it and to um, uh, as Steve said that we do have a series of mini there are mini conferences that are topically focused and we haven't planned our um, topics for uh, library 2.021 yet and um, and we always um, are open to uh, ideas for um, for future topic areas. This past year, we focused on the wholehearted libraries, um, soft skills for the 21st century information professionals. We had one that was focused on small, rural, and independent libraries. And in October, we had one that was focused on sustainability in libraries. And we had really outstanding attendance and participation in that. So I encourage you, if you have some ideas or suggestions for the future, we welcome that and we hope that you'll encourage people to participate in the Library 2.0 community, as well as um, also remind everybody that everything that we've done since 2011 is archived and freely available. So if you have any interest in looking backwards through our archives, they're available to everyone for free. And um, we hope to uh, see you all in a future Library 2.0. 2.0 conference. And I just want to thank um, my partner, Steve. He's been a great partner for, and looking forward to continuing to work with him. And also I want to thank Don, who I appreciate you inviting me and Steve to um, speak today and to this community. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both. This has just been a marvelous session. Uh, so rich and I look forward to playing it again. We also record an archive uh, these sessions. And uh, if you want to, I mean, everybody on this call should be able to find library 2.0.0. Uh, uh, anyway, find the, your, your conference. Uh, but if you want to put a link in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, and uh, we have a, uh, we may have an idea or two that we could put forward our, ourselves, uh, maybe uh, as a contribution to the 
to the session. Uh, I mean, to the next conference, but uh, thank you both we for also, taking the time. Yeah, Sorry. I was gonna say, we also like to collaborate. So always looking yeah, for well, a, more partners. Are. Yeah, so. this, is, this, is, this is collaboration right now. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're gonna close it out, but uh, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute, if you would, please unmute, unmute. Uh, we want to uh, uh, we want to thank our, our speakers, Steve and Sandy, for a great presentation today. Please, let's give them a round of applause. Yay! <laughs> uh, we like to do that. Uh, it, it's just a tiny way to say thank you for, for being here. And uh, we, uh, we close the recording, but we hang out for a little while for just, you know, loose discussion if anybody is up for it. So, Stephen? Uh, you can close the recording.